Well, uh, I think we'll probably get started. It looks like everybody that's normally uh, shows up is uh, here tonight. Um, I want to uh, I want to thank everybody for showing up tonight. Um, I don't know how long tonight will go because chapters 18 and 23 are actually pretty short and pretty straightforward. Um, but I thought it was still a good opportunity for us to at least go through this material and then maybe discuss it. Uh, I did have a couple of questions that I came across that uh, potentially the group could probably answer for me. And then uh, maybe just like open it up, talk a little bit about our studio conference if people are keeping up to date with it, or um, we can end early too. We can go from there. Um, so I think we'll get started. Let me jump over to my notes here. Do, do, do. Let me share my screen. Desktop two. Share. Can everybody see my notes for this evening? All right, cool. Uh, so we'll start with our discussion of chapter 18, which was talking about other markdown files. And really, these were the three learning objectives that I identified. Uh, the first one was to describe the purpose and goals of the readme.md file and the news.md files, uh, and then to implement and implement the use this convenience function to create the readme.md and the news.md files, and then learn how to construct our own readme.md and news.md files, really talking about how to draft those. And so really what this comes down to, this chapter is about two important files for any package that you develop. Uh, the first one was your readme.md file. This readme.md file, the main purpose of it is to describe what the package does. And it really just really tries to give a, I'm going to say a 50,000 foot view of what the package is, uh, what problems it solves, and maybe giving some basic examples of things that it are some of the functionality that it provides. And so, you know, here's just some basic examples of these. Many of you have probably come across this, but here's the dplyr readme. What's really nice about when you use the readme.md file, if you do host your code on like a public repository or on GitHub, or I guess behind a private repository as well this.md format, once it gets submitted to GitHub, gets rendered in HTML. So using some basic kind of MD formatting, which we learned oh, a few weeks ago from Ryan, we can get some of this really nice formatting within our readme file. And so we'll talk more about like how to compose this, but here's just a basic example with um, dplyr. Uh, here's just a basic example with ggplot2. And so I'll share this one with you. And then I thought it was kind of interesting, too, because, you know, uh, obviously the tidyverse has a very specific style for how they want to write their readme. So I was like, let's go find something that's not necessarily in the tidyverse. Um, so I pulled up this example from the Google Analytics R package, a package that I use quite extensively. Uh, this one's kind of interesting when I popped it up to see if it was an example, because it's just legitimately the hex sticker and this line that says, get some more examples here at the website. And then here's how to install it. So obviously the tidyverse has a very specific style guide of how they want you to write it. But at the very base of it, this might be all you really need. Um, I know a lot of people use this Google Analytics R uh, package, so it's not like it's not getting used, but. Colin, do you mind if I interrupt just with no, that go thought for in mind? It. And, and if you cover this topic, I apologize. Uh, so a readme is more of a courtesy to your user. Uh, it's 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 kind of a guide stone or, or guide map of kind of how to do certain things. And I, I don't I, I don't have anything negative towards any developer that doesn't choose to, to author a readme, but it, it's just more um, ethical or uh, courtesy. It's it's saying here, you know what, you're not wanting to look up the vignettes and you don't want to look up all the manual pages and everything related to this package, you know, dig into the code. I'm just going to provide you this nice, you know, easy file that kind of gives you everything that you need in a, in a very short uh, manner. And I, I think you're making a good point of the tidyverse and their form of, of uh, styling for that readme uh, file. I, I, if I'm not mistaken, I, by, by GitHub, GitLab, and any other uh, service, I believe the package prompts you to author a readme file initially. I think that's one of the, the processes of getting it uploaded to the, the version control, if I'm not mistaken. But 
Oh anyway, yeah. I, oh yeah. Yeah. Well, no, I think that's right. When you, like when you create a new repository, it prompts you with the, like when you fill out the form, it's like, do you want to create a readme? So it is correct part of the process yep. in package development. There's going to be some convenience functions because the book su suggests to write yours in um, our markdown, which then gets rendered into markdown. But yeah, it, you, when you set up a repository, it, it prompts you to create a readme, but. Well, I, I was only I was only trying to convey this to any other user that may be watching that um, don't don't lack at creating that readme. Uh, it is actually kind of the first page that a user would probably land on. So um, if you're wanting to uh, uh, appear welcoming and and hey, use my my uh, package that I've I've spent a lot of time and effort, um, don't get to the very end and just not write the readme. Um, or expect that the user is going to uh, know how to navigate into reading more advanced documents. Exactly. I think it's kind of like the, it's like the, it's like the front porch, you know, it makes it very welcoming. And so if you have a very nice, like quick tutorial guide to get you started, it gets you started with it. And then you could start exploring it further. And so um, I like the tidyverse style guide um, for their readme. Uh, how they kind of their style for creating these um, other readmes I've seen um, to be questioned. So, uh, you know, there might be some criticisms of Google Analytics R that it's just like, hey, just go to this website and check it out. Um, but, you know, some people that's that's their style. That's their style for the readme. But like Ryan said, it's a good idea to think about. And this is no criticism towards this because this is a, an excellent package and a lot of people use it. But it's just talking about that there's different styles for readmes. And also too, if you like expand out and you go to like other open open source outside of R, some readmes are like book length. Like they're the readme is the documentation. And so it's like in the R package system or you know, in the system of developing packages, treat your readme as kind of like your front porch to get people introduced to it. And you have these other forms of documentation, whether that be through vignettes or um, creating a website or you know function documentation to have your user explore as they use your functions so but excellent point ryan i think that was a good point to bring up um any other any other questions or comments about readme we're going to dig a little bit more into like specifics about it but i, well, I, really I don't like to like stop um making the readme like it's hard to give an overview without it like sort of encroaching on what should be in like an intro vignette. Um, I, yeah, I find it I find it hard to like just stick to like oh this is sort of what it does and roughly what it does without it being like a full like vignette. <laughs> well, yeah. like a dissertation, right? Or or like an overextended sort of of you know taking away from the purposes of the vignette. No, I I, I would think or support if if I were to either author or read some other person's packages, be able to have some cross uh, uh, use, copy and paste from one file format to another, um, because it, it is complementary of each other. It's just, it's it's an alternative way to, I don't know, bring somebody further into um, answering questions or, you know, why, why is the purpose of your, of your package? Uh, the the key elements uh, behind it. Now, I, I I wanted to add on to Rex's comment, Colin. If you don't mind going back to the to the GitHub page real quick, I don't recall ever reading in packaging yet, and maybe it'll be later. Uh, but the tags, if we notice, like the CRAN 109, uh, our markdown check passing code uh, code cov, 88 uh, percent. Those particular tags, have we covered that, or did I just miss that topic? No, well, we're going to talk about it because there's some convenience functions in, okay, all right. with use this that does these, uh, most of the common ones. I mean, I've seen some that I'm not 100% sure where they come from, but um, yeah, there's some like convenience functions that will set those up for you, but we'll get to those. Any other questions, comments? I think this is a great discussion, by the way. Um, yeah, yeah, Rex, I, I echo that. Like. Um, it's just that scope creep, right? Like, you're just like, I want to include everything, but you just got to really kind of rein it in to, and I mean, I don't have experience of having like my stuff be open, but like internally, like when I have like packages that we're creating internally that I want to share with people, I want to detail everything, but it's like, uh, I don't want to overload everybody with every minute detail of how this package works. So 
And it's even more important, especially when you think about open source stuff, stuff like this, because you want people to use this. Like that's, that's one criteria is to get people to use it. And it can be pretty daunting if you start scrolling and you have to keep scrolling, 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 scrolling. And then you're like, is this ever going to end? Because I've definitely had that experience with um, other open source packages um, outside of the tidyverse. Um, so then the next file is the news.md file. And really the purpose of the news.md file is it describes what's changed since the previous version. So uh, this is mainly targeted, and we'll talk more specific about this, but this is targeted to people that already know and use your package. And so this is just trying to keep people up to date on any specific changes uh, that you've made since your previous releases. So some examples of this would be dplyr. Um, I'm going to pop up dplyr again. I know I'm tidyverse heavy here, but these I just find these to be the best examples. Um, <clears throat> this is written. This is written in in MD format. Um, but basically, what you're going to do here is you're going to create a bulleted list with all the different changes that you've made. And so we're going to talk more about like specific ways to kind of format this. But basically, this news file is going through and describing everything that's changed with each release. And so another example of this would be ggplot2. Here's the news file for this. Again, these are all the changes that are being made. Um, what's really nice about this, too, is especially with the Tidyverse stuff, you can go and look at like the development version. So you can start seeing like things that are being changed as they're in the development version and kind of follow along to see what's like what's going to come out once it goes for the crayon release. And so I think this is a great place to kind of just kind of keep up to date. <clears throat> obviously, these packages are um, obviously these packages are. Um, Obviously, these packages have a lot of, you know, traffic with them and a lot of development in them. So the news files can get very large, you know. <coughs> Excuse me. So most of these are composed in Markdown. Uh, again, the reason is because we want to make them readable as plain text. And then the other thing is we want to render them into HTML so that when they get put onto GitHub or they get put onto blog posts, um, they get rendered into that HTML format. <clears throat> Excuse me. So drafting the readme file. So really, what are the goals? The goals of the readme.md file is, you know, from your user's perspective, they might be asking the question, why should I use this package? How do I use it? And how do I get it? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, so kind of when you're writing your readme file, a general structure to follow is you want kind of this like paragraph with like a high level description. You want to provide some examples of how the package solves kind of like simple problems. You definitely want installation instructions. Uh, if you can make it as easy as copy and paste for your users, do that. And then it's going to overview some of the main components. So a good example of this would be string R. I think this is a good example of kind of like that general structure where it gives like a general kind of couple paragraphs on like what this package does right away. It gives you that kind of copy and paste installation steps. Obviously because it's in the tidyverse, they give like the cheat sheets to kind of show you the functionality of it. <clears throat> but what's also great about this is it provides um, different examples of where these functions can be used and some of the common use cases. But the best part that I think about with string R and how it's developed is that it breaks it down into these kind of main verbs of what it actually does. So it's kind of nice to see that like with this um, with this package and it's readme, it says like, these are the main things you're gonna be doing with strings, detecting, counting, subsetting, locating, and they provide simple examples of what it does. Now, if you dig into the function definitions of these and you look at them, you can see with these arguments, there's a lot of different behavior that can be um, that could be achieved with these functions. But really in the readme, it's just like, we're just gonna show you some very simple examples of problems that this can solve. Makes it very accessible, makes it easy to understand. It doesn't get into like very minute detail, but it just is, it's very welcoming to say like, hey, you can work with strings if you use the string R package. So I really appreciate this readme as a good example of like, <clears throat> being that kind of like front porch to the package itself. 
Uh, so do anybody have any questions about the readme.md file? Okay, cool. So how do we generate this? Uh, just like pretty much everything that we've done in this entire book, there's some convenience functions to help us. There's the use this, use readme uh, RMD file. <coughs> Excuse me. This will um, set up the uh, readme.rmd file for you to work with. So it creates that file for you. And then it also adds this .rmd uh, and the readme to your .rbuildignore file. So it already sets that up because the readme, once the package gets bundled up, doesn't get included within the package. The readme is just mainly for, and somebody correct me if I'm wrong about this, but your readme mainly is mainly for um, like GitHub and, and um, so on and so forth. So a good example of this would be, I'm going to go back to the first uh, kind of package that we were talking about at the start of this entire cohort was the regex excite package. There's an example of the readme MD file here. This was already set up for us, but if we wanted to, what we could do is we could use the use this, use readme at RMD file, and it would set it up for us. Um, I'm not going to do it because it's just going to overwrite it. But what's going to do is it's going to create this readme.rmd file. It's going to set up um, all the NIDR stuff for us and so on and so forth. And what's nice about this is that we basically can compose this MD file in our readme.rmd. So it's just like what we normally used to when we're creating vignettes or anything else. We just develop it all here. Now, the big thing to note is, is that if you're going to follow this type of development of your readme.md file, which the book suggests you do, you need to always knit this file when you're done with it, because the knitting process will convert it over into the readme.md file. Now, <clears throat> what's nice about this, um, oh no, that's that's the news file, so I, I, I got to take that back. So um, you got to make sure that you uh, knit this. Am I saying that right? I got to make sure I'm right about that. You have to knit this to make sure that your readme MD file updates. Is that correct? I might be getting the news.md and the readme.md file mixed up. Uh, you're right. You're right. Okay. No, I think you're right. Uh, Rex, it's the YAML header, correct? <clears throat> Is what tells it to create the MD or, or to update the MD. Yeah. Okay. I'm getting mixed up because I'm thinking of the hook that gets created for the news.md file because there is no hook that's created for this, is there? I don't think so. So like, uh, we'll talk about when we get the news.md, but there's like a there's a there's a git hook on this that for your news.md file that when you set up the news.rmd file, there should be a hook that gets created. So that when you push it to version control, if your readme.rmd file and your readme MD are not updated, it will not accept the commit changes. So I think that's the news file. So I'm getting that confused, sorry. But it's just always good to just know that you need to knit this because it updates that MD file. And I did have a question about that hook um, once we get to that, so, oh. Well, here's the question about the hook and cloning the repo right there. Um, the book says something about, let me see if I can find it. <coughs> Sorry about this, because I it kind of tripped me up. Uh, yeah, it's this hook right here. So if you if you use this convenience function, the use that use use readme.rmd, which I tried to do this, use, use readme rmd, and I ran this, and it's obviously gonna tell me, hey, you know, you already have a readme.rmd. Do you want to overwrite it? Well, I don't. So I say negative. Okay, so it leaves that, but it says that when you do this you know, you have to run this use readme RMD to set up this hook so that it always reminds you to knit your readme file. But I couldn't find it. 
like I was trying to like look through like the dot git folder, look through the hooks, look through this. I couldn't, <coughs> I couldn't find where that hook gets set up. So if anybody knows why that is, because the book says that anytime that you clo clone a repo down, you need to run that function so it sets up this hook. But I can't find it. And so I'm not, I was confused I, by that. Would that be in the knit R that uses that to create the Git hook? I, I, what I'm saying is I, it may not be in the actual package itself. It may be a function of the knit process that creates the hook. So the, the, the function or the, the, the actual snippet that we're, we're using as an example doesn't, isn't contained in in a command within the package that you're building it's a it's a supportive function outside of this hmm. so like like use readme rmd but use this use readme.rmd is calling on a different package to create the hook to support the actual package that you're building um, so the the you you used option two for negative don't overwrite if you chose option three where it says nope does that also cause that same activity well that's, well that's what i was wondering is if i did overwrite it you know if i did overwrite it if it would set up that hook i did this just the other day to make a um rain b and i'm just looking at my hooks and i can see it within like the pre-commit file which is in that same folder that you opened colin but you didn't have anything else there. Huh. It's in like a hooks. Yeah, yeah. I've got a whole bunch of files in there. Huh. That's weird. Not that I've ever like fiddled with them. I, just, <laughs> I guess he used this, just made them along the way. No, it was just it was just interesting to me because I knew that there was this git file that, you know, you know, where those hooks should be set up. And it's just a SHA file. I mean, it's a, you know, here's your shebang. And then here's just basically. You know, it's just an if statement. It's it's basically saying like, if this is not the same as this or updated to this, then push this message yeah. and stop. But I don't yeah, know, maybe I pretty I'm... much got that that chunk in um in that pre commit file. Huh. Um, That's weird. Well, this is a dummy package, so if I screw something up, oh hey, <laughs> I reckon I've done it. Yeah. But that's maybe weird refresh. though. Did it overwrite my? overwrite pre-existing file but you see that's that that's really confusing because it's like hey you're going to overwrite this but it doesn't overwrite it oh huh, that's weird but it looks like it set it up though yeah there it is now there's yeah. my pre-commit hook yeah. yeah huh so i don't know if that's a, a bug or if i'm missing something or because have like, you made any changes to the readme rmd file i don't think so yeah, maybe that's why you can't see any changes because <laughs> it just made uh, the same file. Mm. But that's not, I, I would have thought it would make the pre commit file the first time you did it. I saw, oh. Huh. I was just thinking hidden characters just from opening the file sometimes between the operating systems. The, uh, uh, what is that? Uh, Windows versus Unix uh, file format, the end of line character. It's a hidden character. You don't see it on your screen, but just by opening it, it creates that uh, in the uh, if if it if it is writable, uh, it'll create render it with that extra. So that if you save it, it's technically a different CRC or MD5 of the file. So therefore, it's a difference, and therefore it triggers that. Hmm. So well, I guess my question has been answered there. So. Um... But yeah, so just so you know that when you run this, it sets up this hook and it's basically saying like, it's just kind of a catch all, like before you make your commit, it's going to say like, hey, make sure you make sure you knit this file so that your readme.rmd file updates your readme.md file. So I thought that was kind of neat. Uh, so back to here. Uh, so that's that. That was that question I had. So development badges. So like what Ryan was asking, how do you set these up? Um, there's convenience functions to set these up. So, uh, from what I just understand is that you just run these convenience functions and then they will set up your badges 
um, in your readme file. So if we want the CRAN badge, use this function here. If you want to run some like coverage, again, we're talking about what your test coverage is. You can use use coverage, <clears throat> and then that will create that badge for you. And then if you want to have like your GitHub actions set up to do like the R command check, you could use this convenience function right here and it'll set up that badge. So um, that probably doesn't provide a lot of detail for you, Ryan, but that's the detail that the book has for those badges. No, it was it was in the engineering shiny apps with Colin Faye's book, and we briefly touched on tags. It was the only reason I knew about uh, <clears throat> our studio's ability or, or the call on those particular metadata tags to update what it would render on the on the uh, display. Yeah, excellent. So the next file, so drafting the news.md. So again, these are this file is mainly targeted towards existing users. Uh, it's really the purpose is to kind of list all of those API changes in each release. <laughs> it's going to have this kind of general organizational structure. It's going to have so for every kind of uh, release that you have, you're going to kind of have a general organizational structure where you kind of have a top level heading for each version. So you'll have like the like version change here, and then you'll have like a bulleted list for each change that you make. So what you'll do from there is you're going to break into each subheadings. Um, like you want to put into subheadings, like what, are, like what were all the major changes, what were all the bug fixes and so on and so forth. The other thing that's really nice about this is to include issue and pull requests. <laughs> so make sure that if you have any issues that are related to any of the changes that you've made, you can put the numbers in them. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, what what I thought what I thought that GitHub would do is it would link it in here, but that is not I was gonna the case. I was going to say the same thing. It's it's fine that you have those on there, but that's almost another exercise of the user or the person uh, uh, following these uh, bug fixes uh, or issue issue tickets to go find out exactly what was changed. <coughs> the hyperlink would at least take you directly to that uh, closure. Um, I, I don't know if anybody is familiar with uh, like kernel development or uh, Linux in general, but some not in GitHub, other version control services, but the, uh, the same news.md file, it's not called that, but it's a, a different, the objectives are the same. Those are linked and you can, you can easily navigate through what modifications were made for that uh, uh, build uh, for release. Yeah. This exactly. is almost like a, well, it's like a static way. Like, like, I don't know, the comment you had on your slide says, don't let the work pile up. Um, I, I would see this as almost kind of, I don't know, red tape, uh, but but I don't mean to pass judgment on the package development process. It's just that we don't have an automated system for this. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, is there some some other service that does that? That's a good question. Uh, does anybody want to answer that? I got a, my cat really wants to get it let out. So um, give me two seconds here. You don't like get let out? I uh, I was thinking in you know in the back of my mind whenever you have to physically work on writing something, um, it's usually the first thing that gets pushed off the list of not important. Um, by having more automated tools, Rex, your the the update uh, between the RMD and the MD file uh, that that get push hook you know the synchronized between the two files and it just won't it won't accept the change the. Uh, I would almost be curious if that was an oversight. I can't believe that it would. Um, it makes me wonder if, if you know, it's within GitHub that maybe it's not available. Yeah, I was saying like you can also set up a GitHub action to like re-render the markdown file from the readme.rmd file. And then that saves you having to knit yourself and then push them together or commit them together. But, um, yeah, I, I think that was in one of the examples for the GitHub actions on um, uh, by use this, but I haven't I haven't added it to anything yet. But looks fun. 
yeah, I think there's definitely ways to automate most of the stuff. Um, but yeah, I was kind of surprised when I was looking at the news because I thought that these would actually be linked because that just makes sense, but maybe it's just not set up that way. So, um, and then the last note is, you know, don't let the work pile up, you know, make a note with every change that you make. And I've, as I've kind of moved into this package development phase and kind of my workflow, I always have to remind myself, <clears throat> hey, if you make a change, make a note of it, because before you know it, you're going to have 10,000 changes and then you're going to be spending your entire day just focusing on your news.md file. And that's not fun. I want to code. So <laughs> anyways, uh, that was the that was this one. So any questions about chapter 18? All right, excellent. So let's jump over to chapter 23, life cycle. Um, <clears throat> I think we kind of covered some of this material before, but I think it's probably a good reminder. But here are the kind of uh, learning objectives that I kind of identify for chapter 23. I think chapter 23 is still a work in progress. I think there's still some, some flushing out that still needs to be done. So, but I think we could cover the stuff that was there. Um, when we get to backward compatibility, <clears throat> that one I didn't know a lot about and I it was interesting but I still think there was some stuff that needed to be clarified in that but we'll kind of talk a little bit about it but when it comes to the life cycle the learning objectives is to describe what versioning is and why it's important to package development um, we're going to outline the general version guidelines for package development we're going to discuss backwards compatibility a little bit, and then we're going to overview some of the techniques that the book discussed that are available to ensure that our code is backwards compatible. <clears throat> so what is versioning? Versioning is a type of labeling that we assign to our different releases that we have for our package. Uh, these, So what are releases? Releases are basically any changes that we make to our package. Uh, when we talk about releases, not all releases are treated the same. Uh, the book kind of talks about really these kind of three major releases that you might have. You might have a major release of your package. You might have a minor release of your package and you might have a patch release of your package. We'll drill down to more specifically what those mean, but just know that those are kind of the three distinctions that the book talks about. So why are versions important? Well, versions provide information to our users on what types of changes have been made. <clears throat> so we'll talk about some different versioning guidelines that are out there. And so how we set up our, our versioning number for our package will, is supposed to signify to our users whether it was a major, you know, a major change, a minor change, or we just fixed it or we provided a patch through some bug fixes. The other important thing about versioning that we need to take into consideration at a system level, this helps determine our dependencies. So it's important to remember that following a clear version scheme is important so our users packages can work. And so we also we have to remember that R uses these version numbers to determine the package dependencies and if those package dependencies are being satisfied. And so if we have a versioning system that we're using that doesn't necessarily match up with how R expects it to work, those dependencies might not match. And in that case, what might happen is, is that you might get some unexpected behavior from when your users use your package. So you wanna make sure that you have clear um, versioning set up within your package. So what are some of these guidelines that are out there? There are, there's a more detailed kind of treatment of this uh, that the book shares about. Uh, called semantic versioning. I read this a while ago. It does get pretty abstract. Um, but if you really kind of want like a like a a good description of of how this kind of semantic versioning works, I would definitely check this out. But it really kind of comes down to these kind of basic ideas. When you version, it should at least contain at least two integers. Um, when you have kind of your integers, you should be separating by either dots or dashes. <coughs> the book suggests using a dot. Um, you can mix up the use of the dot and the dash, but the book really highly suggests just using dots. 
in your version numbers, uh, you have to use numbers, no letters. So 1.0.0 is good. 1.0-devel is bad. So avoid those. Um, so what do we mean kind of by the semantic versioning? Going back to that major minor patch release kind of um, framework, that's where those numbers come in. So the first number in this kind of three digit is the first one's going to be your major, your second one is going to be minor, and your third one's going to be patch. And so depending on the changes that you make within your package, that's going to dictate which of those um, numbers increment. And we'll talk about, you know, what is a major, minor, and a patch, but it's just good to kind of keep these three kind of in mind. Now, when you're developing or you're kind of in a development phase with your package, you can add a fourth component <coughs> using this dot 9,000. And you can, as you're developing it, you can increment from this 9,000. The book suggests using this because this is just a good visual cue that it is in development. So once it gets moved into this kind of three digit, this is more of like you've gotten to a point where it's stable and people can use it. And then this kind of 9,000 is a visual cue of, you know, that it is in development and that it's not necessarily as stable as it would be for some of these um, kind of more three digit kind of versions. There, uh, the book says these are general guidelines because there's other, other package maintainers have different philosophies on how they want a version. A good example of this would be the survey package. Um, I don't know. I maybe Brendan has used the survey package before. I maybe um, it's a pretty popular package for any kind of like um, just normal surveys. But <laughs> this one has a different kind of versioning strategy. Um, if I go to the news, you can see that they use the dash here to show their versioning. And I was kind of looking through it and I was kind of trying to figure out like what their kind of general philosophy was on like how they determine like major, minor, and patch. And you can see uh, that I think their patches, they use dashes. And then minor changes get incremented this way. <laughs> yeah, excuse me. But I couldn't determine what was a major. Like I couldn't, I couldn't sit there and I couldn't figure out like what the difference between like two dot to three dot was. So the philosophy might be a little bit different than what the tidyverse uses. So I just brought this in as an example to say like the philosophies are different across different package maintainers. So if you don't mind, Colin, I was going to jump into the topic. Uh, so always remember that S was part of the Bell Labs. Unix was part of the Bell Labs. So the, the, the mindset of versioning is very uh, closely tied between the two parties. So in Unix, we follow or excuse me, I'm not saying we, uh, Unix follows a very similar versioning numbering sequence as well. What I was going to compare it to, and if you don't mind, and anybody that's watching, I don't intend to uh, be negative, but as an example of a comparison to alternative versioning mechanisms that are, in my opinion, hard to understand and read uh, would be Windows. Uh, if anybody's ever tried to track with a Windows uh, version control, um, the, the releases that you get for uh, updates and crashing your system um, is, is always very difficult to navigate through. Um, with the three numbering sequence format, um, there's a, a common um, template or schema, but I don't know if the word schema and definition is the right term to use, but it, it's, it's simple to sequence those numbers together and, and track with what uh, changes, commits, updates, yada, yada, yada has been done. And you can, you can use it as a troubleshooting tool. Um, it worked in one version and now it doesn't work in one, you know, the next, what changed between these two. And so then you can compare and walk through those uh, differences between versions. Yeah. And, and so with this numbering system as well, I think, and I vaguely, I vaguely remember us having this conversation. So, um, but I remember, well, go ahead, go ahead, Ryan. No, I'm, I apologize. I don't mean to, to deter what I was also going to throw into this thought process of versioning in general. Again, if it's referenced in the book or it may just be an extended read, um, is rolling releases versus scheduled releases. Um, and that's a very big topic, uh, whichever stance you take, 
Um, just know that going back and forth between the two is usually a bad plan. Um, the rolling release concept is that um, I'm going to roll up everything that I have, you know, uh, from one date to the next. And then when I release the next version, that's all of the changes that I've made. In a scheduled release, you're literally scheduling bug fixes, you know, oh, this is major, this is minor, I can check, you know, I can repair this pretty quick, I can, I can, uh, uh, you know, may take a long time, I may wait until the next version to, to, to work on it. That scheduled release is a very lockstep on this date, I'm going to release this next version, anything that I may have been able to accommodate gets included, others get rolled over to the, to the next uh, uh, release uh, work cycle. And I apologize. I don't know if anybody is in this thought process um, or, or interact with a software development team, but um, this is always something that I convey in uh, users that aren't familiar with it um, because they are difficult concepts to realize configuration management is very, very critical uh, in any software lifecycle concept. And traceability, I guess that's the last comment I'll make is traceability, being able to to uh, follow others in their uh, versioning numbering sequence. If you have a horrible, horrible system, um, it's gonna be really hard to figure out what the heck went, went sideways on you. No, I think, that's an, I think that's an important point. I mean, you know, the book, the book was pretty honest to say like most users, people who are just using this for interactive analysis, they're just gonna get the most updated version, right? They're just gonna get the most updated CRAN version. But what's important, I think, from that is going back to that R uses that to make sure that your package dependencies are up to date. And so if you want working software for your user, you got to make sure that you have some like setup schema to follow that or else you're going to have like trouble down the road for your users. And so I think you bring up a good point, Ryan. Um, so there's a convenience function for this. So a good example, if I want to go back to my regex excite, I want to bump up the version of this. I can just use, use this, use version. <coughs> um, it's going to tell me I have uncommitted changes, but I'm going to be, um, I'm going to, I like to live dangerously, so I'm not going to commit them. Oh, well, maybe that was, <laughs> that's not what I wanted to do. Um, but we'll do this. I'll say, I, I don't want to commit my changes. So it's going to say, okay, your current version is in development. Do you want to update it? So yeah, do you want to update it as a patch? Do you want to update it as a minor? Do you want to update it as a major? You can make that selection and then the use this package just does everything for you. So um, you can just use this as your own convenience and it just helps you. Uh, my case, because I have uncommitted changes, I'm going to say zero, go back, and then I won't live on the edge anymore. So. Uh, let's see. So what is meant by these patch minor major? Again, this is based on different philosophies, but anytime it's like a patch, these are kind of like bug fixes. Um, and these aren't considered like significant new features, right? You're not adding a new function. You're not adding new functionality. You're just basically fixing issues and things that are wrong. <clears throat> minor changes include things like bug fixes and new features and things that are changing uh, changes to like backwards compatibility. So if like if you're adding a new feature and you also want to add backwards compatibility to previous functions or previous function definitions, then it's a minor kind of update. If it's major, it's going to be changes that are not backwards compatible. So these are like <coughs> major or anything that's like breaking changes. So Cha these are changes that are going to affect many users. Uh, usually when you do a major release, this means that you have a very stable API. And these are um, these major updates can be judgment calls at times. So it just depends on your definition of whether your application programming interface is stable. So, but. Colin? Yeah. Uh, can you explain uh, the changes in changes to backwards compatibility part in minor again how that's different from changes that are not backwards compatible that's a good question um i'm not sure does anybody want to answer that aaron forgive me i did i i was uh busy uh laughing um do you mind repeating the question i'm sorry Oh no! I was it was I was confused about the 
two points that are about backwards compatibility, where they say under minor release changes to backwards compatibility, but under major release it says changes that are not backwards compatible. And what the difference okay. between the two was? Think almost like a like a deprecation, right? Like like a like a planned obsolescence. On this day, you know, we're going to close um, a particular version it's no longer going to be accessed it'll be archived for you know past review purposes but but we're not going to actively pursue it any further this new major release is going to completely rewrite how we uh operate um i can't think of a exact r package that would have a major bug release sorry excuse me major release that would just completely render it useless, like it won't even work anymore type thought process. Um, I, uh, thinking like ggplot uh, or, or any sort of rendering libraries that may have uh, prevented it. Because if we go back and look at some of the CRAN um, versions, uh, Colin, if your tab is still open uh, with the, mm. the ggplot uh, GitHub, uh, I was just curious if it had a, a numbering sequence on it. And Aaron, what I'm what I'm really driving towards here is the fact that at a given point in time with the release of a new package, a new version, the previous is no longer even accessible. Uh, we don't want to um, utilize it in, in moving forward because any code or any functions that were in that previous package are no longer uh, uh, acceptable. And it, yeah. it, it may not be just with CRAN, it may not be just with RStudio, you may have to uh, be reliant on system libraries as well that may no, may lo, may no longer mm -hmm. be available. Um, maybe a security vulnerability has closed that package and that library, sorry, not package, closed that library, it's no longer even available to access to, to use that function anymore. And so therefore it's deprecated and we don't rely on it. Does that answer your question, yeah. Aaron? Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Uh, what was I looking for for you, Ryan? Oh, I was just looking at ggplot's version, CRAN version, it says it's 3.3. .3. So mm -hmm. it, just by inference, we know that there's a version two and a version one. Each one of those would be a major release. So it is implied based on the logic I'm, I'm, I'm conveying that version two and version one, we would not be able to utilize uh, the code base uh, with these uh, anymore. We may be able to find them. Somebody's probably got them mirrored somewhere that we can access, but um, they would not be widely available uh, from a, a, a repository, uh, a library uh, access point. Wasn't I'm kind of thinking, go oh, ahead, sorry, Ryan. go ahead. No, I was thinking that I thought dplyr just recently, some tidyverse package just recently had a bump I think, up to a major no, version. I think, I think it was dplyr. It made it. It may have even just been the tidyverse uh, umbrella that may have also updated or or some uh, accommodations made to the uh, uh, relationship of the tidyverse umbrella. And as it accesses all those sub um, packages, but I don't. I don't think that was a. I don't think that was a major though. I, I believe that was just a minor release. And yes, you're, you are correct. It happened within the last two months, I believe. Yeah, I think Dplyr went from 0. Point something or other to 1.0.0. So that was a major. And, and on their news.md file on their GitHub, they have a list of breaking changes. Mm -hmm. So That's all it. things that don't work, I guess, anymore. That makes sense. Let me see, see if I can find that as an example. Ggplot two examples. So let's go down. Oh, this is ggplot. Yeah, I thought it was dplyr or something. I knew I saw something like recently that was like a recent like major change. One point oh nine. One point. Yeah. So yeah. So Rex brought up the point about like dplyr one point zero. This was a bump up to major. Here's all the breaking changes. So you could go through and you could see like what the breaking changes were. Um, I'm trying to see if there's one that they got rid of. Well, there's uh, there's a couple of functions that we've talked about that are still available, but it's not recommended to use that anymore. So those are like those are those are kind of backwards compatibility. You know, it's not recommended to follow this 
particular function call, it's still contained within the, the package, but it's not recommended to use. Uh, and in the, the thought there would be, it is going to plan on going away eventually. Um, mutate at and mutate if. Man, I miss those functions. Now it's now it's across. I miss them. It took me a while to get my head around the cross, but I still like I still like mutate at. It's still good. Yeah, I always I me at least two tries to get across, right? <laughs> it's just one of those, it's just one of those things where it's like those are like the solid, like because you had like so many tricks that you could use those for. And then they're like, we're gonna throw in this new function called the cross. And I was like, my whole game's changed. So well, I mean, no, so that's a that's actually a good comment. Maybe that that could be a good way of remembering, you know, the differences between a, mi a minor and a major. <laughs> if it causes your users to literally uh, uh, spend, you know, hours on the internet trying to understand what the heck modified, um, maybe that would be a good example of a of a major. I don't know. Well, I mean, the other one too is that it's in my mind is spread and gather. I don't know if anybody remembers spread and gather. Pivot, uh, they transitioned that into pivot, pivot wider, pivot longer. I was glad they made that change. <laughs> but there was also melt, I think, before gather and spread. That's going way back. Yeah, <laughs> melt. That's going way back. That was like when I first started learning R, was I was trying to get my mind around melt. So interesting. And melt was weird because the opposite was not like unmelt. It was like a completely different name of the function. So you could never remember it. Yeah, it was like a different, what was that? Oh, somebody should find out what that was. But yeah, that was a good example. Because it was like the same action, but you were trying to do it like just the opposite way. I think pivot longer, pivot wider is a good compromise, but I'm still bitter about mutate at, mutate if, but... Isn't melt still used for data table? It might be. I'm not sure. That's like the only place I've really I've used it. But yeah, I'm not a fan. I'm not as much of a fan. <laughs> Anyways, uh, let's see. Um, what are the things we got? Uh, so yeah, we're already kind of getting into this backwards compatibility discussion. I'll be honest, like this part of the, the chapter probably still needs a little bit more development. Um, but there's some pros and cons for this, uh, for providing backwards compatibility as you're creating. Uh, oh, cast. It might have been cast. Yeah, that's what it was. Sorry, that was a bad typo on my part. Uh, <laughs> the the one in question mark was not supposed to be there. <laughs> no, it's fine. Um, but some of these like pros and cons for maintaining that backward compatibility compatibility well the first one kind of a pro is it frees it frees up your users from having to worry about breaking code with newer versions so if you take the time to provide backwards compatibility then your users feel you know a little bit better that as you push your package forward it's not necessarily going to break with every version change but that takes away time from you because you have to have a more complex code base to provide all the different pathways to provide that backward capability so you know, pro and con there. Another thing is it's hard to develop new features and fix old mistakes. So do you really want to spend your time like making sure that you're fixing old mistakes so that backwards compatibility still works? Or do you just want to, you know, just move forward, just develop those new features and then go through a depreciation process and then finally get rid of it? You have to make that judgment call. And then it's harder to read because of the past you as a developer need to maintain. I mean, if you are keeping more code in your code base just to maintain that backwards compatibility your code base gets more complex therefore you you're going to have to maintain that code base and so if you're not going to go through that depreciation process you're going to have more code to maintain and so it's just you have to make that judgment call if you are going to provide backward compatibility for older functions or function definitions um the book kind of talks about some different like strategies and techniques that you can use for backwards compatible or for um, backward incompatible changes. If you are going to go through the process of depreciating functions or function definitions, um, <clears throat> the book really talks about this idea that if you are going to make backward incompatible changes, do it sooner rather than later and do it gradually. And so I can't remember this probably was maybe three or four years ago that 
um, the tidyverse packages have really kind of focused on this like life cycle for their functions. Um, and so they've really kind of accepted this idea of like, don't just get rid of a function, have like a depreciation or a life cycle for that function. Um, and what's nice about this is there's an actual life cycle package. So <coughs> um, you can read more about this if you're interested in maybe using this for your own packages. But as I was kind of digging through like some of the, the some of the tidyverse packages to see how they manage it, they use this life cycle package to help them depreciate and and maintain the life cycle of functions that they're intending to be experimental or depreciate so on and so forth. And what's really cool about this, if if you've kind of seen some of those like messages that you've been getting, if you read this vignette stages from the life cycle packages it will kind of discuss the philosophy of what it means for a function to be experimental, depreciated, stable, or superseded. Um, it's got me curious right now. I know we're kind of getting close to time. We're almost done here, but let's see. Uh, uh, now I'll look it up later. Like the, like, so anytime that you do like mutate now, there's like these like adverbs of like dot before that you can use, but those been have are like experimental. And so in the function definition, there's like experimental, like it's, it has like the badge experimental and so on and so forth. Um, Cause we're running out of time. I don't want to spend waste everybody's time for me digging to find an example, but um, that's where this comes from is this philosophy that the tidy versus kind of accepting is this idea of experimental functions being stabled, going through that depreciation process and superseded. And so if you're interested in what those definitions are, <coughs> this is where they come from. And so I highly suggest reading through this because it gives you a good idea of, well, what does it mean that it's experimental? So um, definitely take this and, and read it if you can. Um, I mean, we could quickly run over some of these techniques that the book talked about. Um, uh, I mean, basically the book was talking about that if you are going to depreciate a function, it's good to just have like a <coughs> good timeline of like what version you intend to get rid of a function. But as those versions or as you're getting closer to it, you're, you have like some way to inform your user as they're using that function that it's going to be potentially depreciated at some time. And so it suggests that within your function definition, you have a way to output this message to say, hey, this function is going to disappear at some time, read some more documentation about it. So if you're interested, here is one example of how to do it. The book also talks about this in the sense of if you're going to depreciate like a specific argument within a function. So a good example of this would be to use just like a, a conditional statement to say, hey, if Y is missing, just so you know, it's going to be depreciated soon. So please use Z instead. And so it's just another prompt for your user to know, hey, things are going to change. It's going to go away. Um, but just know in your timeline that you know what version that that, that argument's going to go away. The book goes even further to say what happens if you're getting rid of a lot of code. Um, there was this example from ggplot2, this gg uh, dep function. And I actually went and looked up the source code from this. And basically, <coughs> this function is just kind of a, it's in the utilities portion of the package, but it's basically um, outputs a depreciation message for like a certain specific area in the code um, based on the specific version that the user is, is currently using. And so this is just another strategy if you're going to get rid of a lot of code. Um, definitely check that out if that's a situation that you're in. <clears throat> and then this one got kind of, I don't know, this one I really don't have a good explanation for. Maybe someone could clarify this. But if you want to use functionality of a new version of another package, you can do this kind of checking for the version at runtime. Now, I didn't really understand where you might use this. So I'm just going to open it up to the group and ask, did anybody get a good sense of where you might apply this, um, this technique?
not from a use case scenario, but do you recall Brendan and Aaron, we were all discussing the backwards compatible thought process of being able to load an older version of a package or, or you know, where we always say, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be uh, the most bleeding edge, latest and greatest. And then, you know, uh, eventually cut off. We're not going to, we're not going to support anything before that. And then the other inversion of that would be, you know, we're going to support up to version this, you may have to go download that from another area to, to make our function or our package work. Would this be a possibility of when that logic would come in, that inversion thought process would come in? So if, you, if you just read, if package version ggplot2 is less than 1.0, stop, you're going to need something greater than that. Um, if we were to change that, I guess is my question, uh, make it saying that you have to use something before 1.0 uh, to be able to, to access a, a different package function. And maybe I didn't make sense at all. That's okay too. No, I think your point, I think, I think as you were talking, it kind of clarified it for me a little bit. You know, why might you use this like right here, like if package version, you know, stop, you know, throw a warning. Maybe your user has a constraint where they aren't going to go above one zero zero or yeah, that they can't go above this major version for some reason. Well, I'm thinking like our environment type, like type concepts, right? So we are rendering a particular environment specific to um, some particular use case. And, and I apologize, security is the first thing that always comes to mind because you're always testing this extremely unique uh, scenario to find out, you know, somebody else is having a problem with me, go see if I can recreate that exact instance. And so to accomplish that, you would want to make sure that the service is going to say, hey, wait a second, hold on, you need an older version or, you know, a previous version of a package. I, I, I may not, I may be misinterpreting this. Um, the, the way the, the, the logic of this is, is looking, because it's saying if the package is less than 1.0, stop, you're going to need something greater than or equal than 1.0 or above to make this work. Mm -hmm. It's like a force to go update. Um, I run in that, into that all the time. Um, <laughs> go and try and try something and realize, oh crap, my, my, entire eco, uh, my entire RStudio ecosystem packages are all out of date. So yeah, let's go ahead and just do this mass update. I guess if you knew like there was like a function that you depended on from another package that definitely needed to be there to work, then I could see where this would come and in, come into play. Hmm. So this would only make sense for a dependency that in under suggests, right? Not under imports. Or I don't know. That makes sense. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think I think the book was also saying like if you don't want to force your users to a specific version through like imports and suggests, right? Something like that was what it was getting at. <clears throat> then you could use this kind of technique, and so that yeah. makes sense. Like if you didn't want to change your users' art, you know, their landscape, but you want to make sure that they have a specific version, this is another technique to do that. Is what I understood it as, but no, that's a good point, Aaron. I think that's I think that's dead on. Cool. Any other comments, questions? I know we're at nine oh six. So if anybody has to jump off, you know, don't uh, don't worry about jumping off um, if you need to. But um, we're really close to finishing this kind of these last these couple chapters. So I was going to ask before Rex exited. Rex uh, coming up is going to be a uh, GitHub workflow. Um, uh, what's the what's the proper term for that? GitHub actions. Uh, do you, I, I, I currently uh, wrote my name down. Actually, Colin, was I supposed to give this presentation? This one? Uh, the one no, today? no, it was websites and continuous integration. Um, oh, maybe not. Maybe, never mind. Never mind. Sorry. I thought one of your presentations was websites. Um, I was asking Rex or any of the team, if I were to give a stab at this continuous integration, the chapter is very lackluster, there's not much to it. Um, but it, it does pull in a lot of containerized workspace, Docker, GitHub Actions, some of these uh, more 
CICD type thought process. I, I didn't want to step on Rex's toes. I know that, that that was a conversation or a topic that you had brought up as well. No, I've just used like two of the use this functions to make my GitHub actions. I really have no idea what they're doing. Okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> I think you're definitely the best person for that one. Yeah. Well, I, I don't, because I, I want to be careful. I haven't done this from an R perspective. So I am going to have to do a little bit of research and I have not tried it necessarily with R. I do have a, an example of a CI CD that I do currently have active uh, action, but it's not on GitHub. Um, it's actually using Jenkins, uh, no, uh, excuse me, Flask. I think it was a Python Flask bit, but it, it is calling on some services. The other one that I had an example of is a reveal JS presentation uh, medium where it would ingest a markdown file and then generate a reveal JS output. But the, the middle process is Docker uh, or, or a CI CD type mindset and, and Git, uh, GitLab, in fact. So I don't want to pull anybody away from GitHub if you're stuck on that or if you're, you're familiar with that. I can I do mean, it within that context too. I mean, looking at this, because 19 and 21 are not done, uh, it's it's free reign. I mean, I think I just put it as like a maybe question mark if somebody had some experience. If, if you want to take a crack at it, Ryan, I mean, I'm, I'm more than happy to to schedule some, you know, to keep that session there, the 10th. And then, well, it's it's a very interesting topic. It is the future. The CICD type type mindset is kind of the future of development in general, um, utilizing compiling tools like this. Uh, there is a, if anybody is following the conference uh, channels, there is a, a, a DevOps um, uh, a channel, and they are talking heavily about Kubernetes and Docker and all levels of yeah, CICD. So um, I'm not going to plan on tagging any of those individuals, but um, if they share any content that I might be able to capture and, and reuse, uh, would be helpful too. Yeah, I, I support that 100%. Um, for next week, and I don't want to put you on the spot, Rex, uh, and, uh, and I want to respect your schedule. Um, but looking at these two chapters, I was thinking that you probably have the most experience with this. Um, I don't want to put it, it, it's totally okay to say no, like I want to respect your schedule and stuff, but, um, you know, if you want to do this, just let me know. Um, let me know later in the week if you have to, but I was looking at these two chapters, the, like the R command check this is like, just like a bulleted list. And I don't necessarily think that we need to cover every single one of these. Um, but I think like we could probably some summarize most of this stuff. And then the releasing to CRAN is actually a uh, few sections. So, but I don't know, Rex, if you're interested and, and you're willing, you know, you can let me know later this week, but, um, or if anybody else know. wants to. I'd, I'd like to, but I'm so uh, time poor at the moment. I don't think I've got, um, I wouldn't be able to do it justice at this point. I've got a talk on, on this coming Wednesday night and I, I've got a lot to do before that. <laughs> no, I <laughs> totally respect that. Yeah, thanks. No, I totally, I totally respect that. So um, yeah, no. Uh, well, here, here's a question. Uh, Ryan, what if we switch these two? Could you get a talk? Could you get a discussion together by next week? Oh, sure. Sure. I, it's just me st making a stab in the dark and seeing if it'll work. Um, the only thing that'll happen is, is I can also uh, talk about what didn't work, <laughs> um, <laughs> be able to convey it that way too. And then I don't know, Rex, so then you can still think about it. Like I said, I obviously want to respect your time, but maybe the 10th, if you, if you, if you have time, but like I said, if you don't like, you could totally tell me no, and I could, I could put it together too. <laughs> yeah, no, I think, I think that would work. I'm happy with that. Okay, cool. Well, I'll swap those two and then I'll, I'll check in with you again next week, Rex, and see if you're still able. Um, like I said, I hate putting people on the spot, but I know you're, you're the one with the most experience in that area, but if we have to, we can, I could, I could cobble something together too real quick. So don't, don't hurt. Don't worry about hurting my feelings. If you have to tell me no. <laughs> Gotta, I reckon that'll be fun. Cause I've got a pretty um free week after, after next week. So yeah, it should be sweet. All right, cool. All right, we'll make that swap. Um, and pretty much we just have like two weeks left unless Hadley for some odd reason or Hadley or Jenny gets a big dump or adds another chapter or something. So 
we're really close. We're really, really close. So about two more weeks and this book will be, will be finished. So, all right, cool. Well, I can hang off for a couple more minutes if anybody has any other questions or wants to talk, chat a little bit more, but other than that, everybody have a good rest of your night. Thanks. Yeah.